This conference will now be recorded. Welcome everyone to our live conference and thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Nabi Ikram and I'm a radiologist in upstate New York. I will be moderating this session. Let me introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Umar Awan, who is an associate professor of radiology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He is an MSK radiologist with a special interest in teaching and informatics. He is board certified by both the American Board of Radiology as well as the American Board of Imaging Informatics. Today he will be discussing MSK infection with emphasis on CT and ultrasound. Welcome Dr. Iwan. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Nabia. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, let me just try and share my screen here. Um, let me uh, say a few more things. Sure. Um, I have no disclosures. And before we start our lecture, I would like to know a little bit about our audience. Please tell us if you are a radiologist or a radiology trainee at pollf.com slash nigram310 and click on the proper response. This poll has been made using Poll Everywhere. So I see only one person has responded so far and they are a radiologist. Radiologist. So please go to pollf.com slash nigram310 and click on the response. Uh, radiologist at uh, polleb.com. Uh, and I would uh, request uh, if people can uh, stay muted throughout the lecture. All right, let's move on. Uh, I would like to go over the chat and audio options on the GoToMeeting platform. If you look at the top right corner of your screen, you will see the icon for chat. If you click on it, it will open another window. You can write your questions here during the lecture and make sure that you have selected everyone so that everyone in the audience can read your question. We will try to get to most of the questions at the end of the lecture as the time permits. Also, once again, I would like to request our audience to keep their audio muted throughout the lecture. Thank you. The lecture will be recorded and uploaded on the Aparna website. Please explore this website www.aparna.com when you get a chance. Now let me hand over the controls to Dr. Awan to begin the lecture. Thank you. Dr. Awan, you are the new presenter. Okay. Thank you so much, Nabia. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Nabia has really worked very hard to make this occur. So, you know, many thanks to her and may God and Allah SWT bless her for this effort. So again, my name is Umar Awan. Assalamu alaikum. It's very nice to be here. It's an honor to, to be here as one of the first lectures for the APRNA. Um, and it's, and it's, it's great to be here. So I'm actually going to be using RSNA Diagnosis Live, which is a web-based audience response tool for this lecture. So you can, everyone in this audience can actually go to live.rsna.org. If you go to live.rsna.org, or you can go on the website that's posted right down here where it says http colon backslash slash bit.ly backslash 2vpchjz. If you go to this website, you can log on to the site with any social media account. So if you have Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, you can log into this, log into this, and then you'll get the lecture on whatever you're using. So on your phone, on your tablet, on your computer, whatever you're using, you'll be able to see all my slides on the computer and you'll be able to participate in some of the audience response questions that, that you'll see during this lecture. So again, if you go to live.rsme.org or if you go to the specific website on the bottom, 
you'll be able to log in to this lecture. You'll see all the slides on your phone or on your computer, and you'll be able to answer the questions that I'm going to be asking during this lecture. Okay, so maybe I'll give you guys a minute or two just to log in. Um, so far, three people have been logged in, so it looks like me, Nabia, and Javad Malik are logged in, but you know, more people can log in. It's totally free, and you'll be able to interact with the lecture, you know, do multiple choice questions with us. We'll see, you know, anonymous, all the responses will be anonymous, so we won't know who's getting questions right or wrong, so it's, it's not a big deal, um, but it, I think it is a very unique tool to use during the lecture. So maybe if some people can kind of log in, um, that would be great. And again, it's live.rsna.org or the specific website here. And you can log in with any social media account that you have. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, any of those work, your username and password. You should be able to get this lecture um, and you'll be able to sort of log in. Okay, so okay, maybe I'll just get started here. So, you know, this is this is I like to start all of my lectures with um questions um, and we're going to come back to these questions as we go so the first question i have is what is the next best step in management so you know is it you know based on the ct image is it to administer antibiotics is it to call surgery is it to obtain an mri or is it careful observation what's the next best step in management Looks like one person has answered this question, but maybe I'll give some folks a couple seconds to log in. So what would the next, based on the CT images that you see here, what's the next best step in management? Okay, we'll move on here. So the answer here was call surgery. Looks like the two people that answered it answered it correctly. So that's great. Well, we'll talk about, we'll come back to these same exact questions at the end of the lecture, I promise. I just want to show these questions to sort of stimulate your minds to sort of think about the key concepts that will be presented during this lecture. So that's question number one. Question number two is you're showing an ultrasound image. Okay. And the question is, what's the most likely diagnosis? Is this an abscess? Is this myositis? Is this cellulitis or is this necrotizing fasciitis based on the sonographic appearance of this <clears throat> lesion within an extremity? What, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Is it an abscess? Is this myositis? Is this cellulitis? Or is this necrotizing fasciitis? Okay, we'll go to the next question here. So this was in fact an abscess. And again, we will come back to these questions at the very end of the lecture. I have just five questions at the beginning. So the third question here, you're looking at a CT image through the level of the sort of the thoracic inlet here. And what's the most likely organism that's involved in producing the pathology that you're seeing on the CT image with intravenous contrast? Is it Streptococcus, Staph aureus, Bacteroids, E. coli, or Pseudomonas. Which organism do you think is responsible for producing the imaging findings that you see on the CT image through the thoracic inlet at the chest? Okay, let's move on to the next question here. The answer here was, of course, Staph aureus, and we'll, just, we'll explain why that's the case later on in the lecture and at the end of the lecture. Uh, question number four is based on this ultrasound image. You're looking at the elbow. This is an ultrasound image of the elbow, okay? And the question is, this can be seen in what entity? So O stands for electronon. So we're looking at, we're looking at the posterior aspect of the elbow. This is the electronon. This T is the triceps tendon that's inserting onto the electronon. Okay, so the arrow is pointing to something, and the question is, what this the finding that you're seeing on the ultrasound? It can be seen in what? Can it be seen in rheumatoid arthritis, Paget's disease, both rheumatoid arthritis and gout, or all of the above? When, in what circumstance do you see this type of abnormality? <clears throat> 
Okay. We're going to move on. Looks like no one got this question right so far, and that's okay, because that's what this lecture is for. So the answer was uh, rheumatoid arthritis and gout, but we will explain why that's the case later on in this lecture. And the final question I have before we actually start this lecture is, what's the abnormality seen around the fibula? So you're looking at the tibia and the fibula. It's a C axial CT image through the lower leg. Is this an involucrum that we're seeing? Is this a sequestration? Is this an abscess or is this a tumor? What are we seeing in the fibula here? So is this an involucrum? Is this a sequestration? Is this an abscess? Or is this a tumor? <clears throat> okay, let's uh, advance this. So this was definitely an involucrum. Looks like everyone got this right. So we're going to come back again to these questions at the end of the lecture, and we'll have maybe a couple questions interspersed within the lecture itself to make sure that everyone is still awake here. So I appreciate everyone in Pakistan who is on the on the call. It's, I know it's eight o'clock in the morning, so mashallah, kudos to you guys. Okay, so what we're going to do here today is we're going to provide a spectrum of the most common musculoskeletal infections that we encounter in clinical practice. Okay, so. I'm gonna give you sort of a roadmap of the different types of musculoskeletal infections that we see. We're also gonna elucidate the role of particularly CT and ultrasound in diagnosing these infections. So obviously you can use radiography and diagnosing infection, you can use MRI and that would be a totally separate lecture, but we're, the, the purpose of this lecture is really to focus on CT and ultrasound in diagnosing these lectures and why we use them and when we use them. And then we're gonna talk about the various imaging findings of the more common musculoskeletal infections that you we'll probably see on a daily basis, if not daily, on a weekly basis. Okay. So let's just talk about the spectrum of the MSK um, um, and, the, and sort of why we care about this. So, you know, I understand that a lot of people here are, are, are from Pakistan, but in the United States where I practice, you know, 2 million people get di diagnosed with musculoskeletal infections annually in our emergency department. So that's, that's a big number. Okay, so I see, I see these infections on a daily basis when I read when I read at University of Maryland. And you know, the risk factors for musculoskeletal infections include you know, things like IV drug use. So there are a lot, of, especially in the inner city where I, where I practice, there are a lot of IV drug users. Okay? Diabetes is a very um, common disease in the United States and I'm sure in Pakistan as well. HIV, sickle cell disease, peripheral vascular disease, and any immunocompromised state. So people that are organ transplant recipients, organ donors, um, people that are on steroids, um, you know, those type of patients that are immunocompromised with opportunistic infections, which we definitely see in Pakistan um, and different countries in Asia, they're going to be at risk for developing a lot of these musculoskeletal infections. So, you know, the, the number is 2 million in the United States. It may be well above that in Pakistan. I'm not sure. I don't know the epidemiology behind the incidence of musculoskeletal infections in Pakistan. But I think th this is very relevant for, you know, all patient populations, essentially. So let's talk a little bit about the spectrum of the MSK infections. And I'm going to talk specifically about seven different disease entities today. Okay, so I'm going to talk about cellulitis, which is extremely common, necrotizing fasciitis, which may not be as common, but a very important diagnosis for us to entertain, myositis, soft tissue abscesses, osteomyelitis, which is sort of the, you know, the holy grail of infection in the underlying bone, septic arthritis, which kind of goes hand in hand with osteomyelitis, and then an entity called septic bursitis. So I think these seven uh, infections are tend to be the most common infections that we see in musculoskeletal imaging, and are you know are, are going to be the hallmark of the talk that you're going to receive currently. So let's talk about the role of CT and ultrasound in diagnosing these, because that CT and ultrasound are very important in making these diagnoses. Um, you know, when we use X-rays, are usually not adequate to diagnose the type of infection, and the reason why is is that if you see soft tissue gas on an x-ray, let's say you're looking at an x-ray of the lower leg and you see soft tissue gas, it may not be clear exactly where that gas is. You may wonder, well, is that gas in the muscle? Is it in the fascia between the muscle? Is it between the subcutaneous fat and the fascia? Um, is it, if it's close to the bone, is it really in the bone? Is it on the cortex or is it in the subperiosteal region? It's hard to compartmentalize the location of gas or other findings that we see on x-ray. So oftentimes x-ray or radiography is not adequate 
to specifically diagnose the type of musculoskeletal infection. So CT or cross-sectional imaging is usually important to compartmentalize the anatomy and to understand, well, what space are we dealing with? What are, is this in the subcutaneous fat? Is this in the fascia? Is this within the muscle? Is this within the bone? Is this within the periosteum or the endosteum of bone? So these questions can be identified particularly with CT and sometimes with ultrasound as well. Um, CT and ultrasound can also guide treatment. So if we see, let's say we see a big or large abscess on ultrasound or CT, we can actually put, you know, a percutaneous drainage catheter through CT guidance and through ultrasound guidance. So that becomes very helpful from a therapeutic standpoint when we look at these um, infections. And ultrasound, because it, as we all know, it lacks radiation, it's cheaper than CT, um, it can be performed in real time, we can look at the other side for comparison. It has many real advantages um, when we look at, um, you know, in using ultrasound to, and I think it's a very powerful modality. It's actually is my favorite modality. I love to use musculoskeletal ultrasound when I look at, you know, when I evaluate my patients. And it's something that's growing here in the United States using ultrasound to look at muscles, the musculoskeletal system essentially. So let's talk about the different seven pathologies and talk about their imaging findings. And we're gonna start with cellulitis. So the cellulitis is extremely common. I'm sure every one of us sees this nearly on a daily basis. So cellulitis, as we know, is an infection. It's usually an acute infection of the subcutaneous tissues and the dermis of the skin. So it's a very superficial infection, okay? Um, it's usually a result of staphoids. In fact, almost the vast majority of the infections that I'm talking about today are a result of staphoids with some few exceptions that I'll talk about. You know, patients with diabetes and patients with peripheral vascular disease tend to be more susceptible to getting cellulitis, but almost anyone can get cellulitis nearly at any time. And, you know, it's not a critical diagnosis to make, although we see it very commonly, this is usually treated conservatively. We, don't, we usually don't do much unless there's a super infection or it becomes an abscess or something else that's more sinister where we need to treat it more aggressively. And really what we're looking at, you know, we're looking, you know, this is a CT image through the level of the, the globes or the orbits. And if you take a look at the right eye, we notice that there's a lot of skin thickening superficial to the eye. There's a lot of subcutaneous edema superficial to the eye. And even, you know, in the, in the, um, in the retroclonal space, this is the sort of, the sort of the optic nerve and the extraocular muscles. There's infiltration of the fat within the retroclonal fat. So all of this is suggestive of cellulitis. Okay, this is actually preceptal and actually even postceptal cellulitis. You know, I'm not a neuroradiologist, but this is a nice example of, you know, preceptal and postceptal cellulitis because we're seeing not only the edema and inflammation superficial to the, um, the globe, but also within the retroclonal fat. Okay, so this is a great example of what cellulitis would look like on a CT image. If we look at an ultrasound, this is an image of through the lower extremity, I believe. Um, Notice here, this, this area here is the muscle. You can see the nice hyperechoic fibroadipose tissue superimposed on hypoechoic tissue here, okay? This is what striated muscle looks like, okay? This here is a skin surface, and this here is the subcutaneous fat. So notice that there's sort of a cobblestone appearance to the subcutaneous fat here. That's typical, there's a typical sonographic ultrasound appearance of what cellulitis looks like, where you get, you know, increased echogenicity, um, anechoic strands, and sort of this cobblestone appearance of the subcutaneous fat. Very typical for cellulitis and ultrasound. If, if you guys do ultrasound regularly, you will see this definitely on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, okay, on your patients. So very classic case of cellulitis. Let's move on to necrotizing fasciitis, which is, which is a very serious disease. In fact, it's a surgical emergency, okay? So we don't see this very commonly, but when we do, it warns us to call, take, pick up the phone and call the doctor or the referring physician because the patient will need emergent surgery. Because the reason why is because it's a rapidly progressive, sometimes fatal disease, okay? It can lead to compartment syndrome. Um, it, it's, it's associated with necrosis of the deep fascia. Um, it can be very debilitating and damaging for patients, okay? It's usually it's not usually just saphoids like some of the other infections. It's usually a polymicrobial infection, um, usually from gas-forming organisms, okay? Necrotizing fasciitis is very serious. The mortality is 70 to 80%. I mean, that's amazing. That number is astonishing. I mean, it's so high, it's not treated very fast. So that's why it's a very critical diagnosis for us to make if we see it. And, you know, the treatment usually involves surgical debridement, aggressive antibiotic therapy, and it should, must be done promptly. 
Yeah, the key to making the diagnosis is understanding the compartments in the lower extremity. Gas needs to be present in a, within the fascia. So if you see gas within the sub-Q fat, that's not necrotizing fasciitis. That's just cellulitis caused by uh, a gas-forming organism. If we start to see gas within the muscle, that's not necrotizing fasciitis. That's myositis caused by a gas-forming organism. It's the if, it's if we see the gas insinuating between the fascial planes between muscles, in the space between muscles, that suggests a diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. And again, I want to remind everyone here that necrotizing fasciitis is a clinical diagnosis. So even though we see gas between muscles and fascial planes, we can suggest a diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis, but it needs to be correlated with the clinical scenario of the patient. Because if the patient is alive and well, doing well, walking around, the patient does not have necrotizing fasciitis. So we can only suggest a diagnosis, but it's really a clinical diagnosis based on how the patient is doing. But the way we suggest it is on a CT, if we start to see gas insinuating between fascial planes like this case here um, in the thigh, we see gas between the muscles of the posterior compartment here of the distal thigh, okay? So it's not the gas in the muscle that's the problem, it's this gas between the muscles, which suggests the diagnosis of necrotizing fasciitis. Okay? And again, this is a surgical emergency, okay? If we were to do an ultrasound, we would see dirty posterior acoustic shadowing from the gas particles that are between muscles, okay? So notice that there's shadowing, but it's dirty. You know, there's a lot of, you know, hyperangiogenicity from the shadow. That's usually related to gas, okay? So I've never seen this on ultrasound, so I took this from, you know, from a journal article that's cited right here, okay? So this is a, this is an ultrasound case of necrotizing fasciitis. Moving on to myositis, which represents infection of the underlying muscle, okay? Now we're, you know, there are different compartments. The key is to understand the different anatomy in the compartments because we went, we started superficially at the subcutaneous fat that was cellulitis, then we talked about the fascia, which is a space between muscles, and now we're talking about infection within the muscle itself, okay? So this is actually very commonly seen in young people, more commonly in young people. It's usually a result from staph aureus, and the risk factors include HIV, uh, traumatic cases, and, you know, patients that have, you know, crush injuries from rhabdomyolysis. Those are the patients that get myositis, infection of the underlying muscles. Now, most commonly, this happens in the thigh, in the quadriceps muscles. So we're talking about the rectus, femoris, the vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, and vastus intermedialis, okay? But then the gluteal muscles and the iliopsoas muscles can also be infected. Nearly any muscle in the body can be infected, but we most commonly see this in the hip and thigh region. And there are three clinical stages of myositis, all of which are progressive. So first of all, it starts out as pain and edema within the muscle. Then there's a suppurative or infection phase where, you know, phlegma and abscess forms within the muscle itself. And then End stage, it can lead to even sepsis, toxicity, and you know, quite frankly, even death if it gets severe enough and the patient gets back to treatment. Okay, so this can be also a deadly uh, situation, but oftentimes it's controlled well with antibiotics, and oftentimes it, you know, we only see the first phase of it, which is the pain and the edema within the muscle. You know, if we do MRIs, we typically see the T2 hyperintense edema within the muscle itself. Okay, but this this was a this was an index case that I showed you at the beginning of the lecture. This is a frank case of myositis of the pectoralis muscle, right? So at the, at the brass skin that you see, if you take a look here, the pec, pec major, pec minor on the other side, this is a normal appearance. But here there is enlargement of the muscle and the muscle looks heterogeneous. There's hypoattenuation or, you know, dark, you know, attenuation within the muscle. This, these are all findings suggestive of myositis, okay? Hypoattenuation of the muscle or enlargement of the muscle are the findings that we look for to suggest myositis. So an ultrasound, you know, I showed you a normal appearance of a muscle earlier on uh, when I was showing you cellulitis, but typically you will see, you know, heterogeneity within the muscle. The muscle will become enlarged and there'll be areas of hypoechogenicity within the muscle, okay? Eventually, you know, when you get to the suffering phase, you can get an abscess. Stage two of myositis, you can get an abscess. So this is sort of developing phlegmon and myositis. Um, I'd have to put color on here to see if there was peripheral hyperemia to suggest an abscess, but this is definitely a case of myositis within the muscle. The muscle, we, can, we can't even see the, the striated architecture of the muscle in this ultrasound because it's being replaced by hypoagenicity and heterogeneity. Okay, so this is a nice ultrasound case of myositis. And oftentimes it's hard on an ultrasound or even a CT to really differentiate 
a hematoma or a seroma from an abscess. And oftentimes, clinically, we have to know that. If the patient has a fever, if they have infection, then we know that it's likely myositis or an abscess, right? So sometimes we have to aspirate this if we don't know. Uh, but, you know, if it is infected, then we give antibiotics, okay? These myositis can certainly lead to other more grave consequences, such as compartment syndrome, even osteomyelitis, the infection of the bone. Um, and I said, and as I said, you know, if it goes to stage three, where you get septicemia, bacteremia, you know, the patient can unfortunately die as well. So it's, it's an important diagnosis to make, but again, most of these tend to be well controlled. Okay, so let's talk about the next, I think, nice example would be a soft tissue abscess. And an abscess is really like a localized infected fluid collection, okay? Most commonly from staph aureus or MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus. And typically, again, we see this, everyone, you know, on this talk is familiar with what an abscess looks like, you know, uh, a fluid collection with peripheral rim enhancement on CT or on an ultrasound, a hypoechoic or heterogeneous fluid collection with peripheral hyperemia, okay? So, and without solid internal enhancement, okay? So that's what an abscess looks like, okay? So typically we treat this with aggressively with antibiotics and sometimes we drain this with a drainage catheter via CT or ultrasound. So that's why CT and ultrasound is so powerful because they allow us to not only make the diagnosis, but also it offers us therapeutic options as well. Okay, so this is a CT image with intravenous contrast. Looking at the level of the axilla, and we see a nice, you know, fluid collection with peripheral rim enhancement. Okay, this is a soft tissue abscess, you know, adjacent to the axilla. Okay, a beautiful example of what I'm sure everyone knows. This is, this was shown in one of the questions in my case. So this is a you know, heterogeneous hypochoic collection. And notice that there's a lot of peripheral vascularity or hyperemia around this collection. So this is a nice, beautiful case of what a soft tissue abscess would look like. Okay, heterogeneous hypochoic collection with peripheral hyperemia. This is not a diagnostic dilemma for probably anyone on this lecture, okay? Moving on to osteomyelitis. So osteomyelitis is, you know, the holy grail of, you know, what we talk about in imaging. You know, it's infection of the underlying bone. There are three routes that people can get osteomyelitis. Okay, one can get it from hematogenous spread, contiguous spread, or direct inoculation. Let me explain what I mean by that. So direct inoculation is when, you know, a patient gets osteomyelitis when the bone gets directly affected, either from surgery or from trauma, right? There's penetrating trauma and, you know, the patient just gets infected, the bone gets directly infected, okay? Hematogenous spread is when it, it, the infection starts within the bone, from the bone marrow, as osteomyelitis, and it goes out. So it starts in, and it goes out. So it starts as osteomyelitis, then it becomes osteitis, or infection of the cortex, then it becomes, um, you know, you know, subperiosteitis, then it becomes, you know, then it goes into the soft tissues, it may become myositis, you may develop an abscess, then it can become, you know, cellulitis, and then eventually it can form an ulcer, and, you know, you know it, it goes in to out. The opposite is contiguous infection. That starts out and it goes in. So it may start as a soft tissue ulcer, a decubitus ulcer, where the, then it becomes cellulitis, where the subcutaneous fat gets infected, and then there can be myositis with the muscle getting infected, and then eventually osteitis with the cortex getting infected, and then the bone marrow getting infected, and that's osteomyelitis. So you can see that there are three different routes for osteomyelitis to occur. You know, in young people, it most commonly occurs from trauma, right? But in, 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 in the extremes of age, the children and the elderly, it's usually from septicemia, okay? And again, the most common pathogen is staph aureus. Staph aureus is involved in almost every musculoskeletal infection, except for necrotized infection, where it tends to be polymicrobial. And usually this is treated aggressively with IV antibiotics, typically for four to six weeks. We have to give IV antibiotics for osteomyelitis, okay? Um, you know, radiography is not that helpful. I mean, it is if you see cortical irregularity or destruction, but x-rays can be normal for up to two to three weeks after the person gets infected. So, you know, the patient comes into the emergency room, you know, they have, they got infected three, four days ago. We may not see evidence of that on an x-ray. So that's why, you know, doing a CT or an MRI is actually very important. In fact, MRI is the most important modality to diagnose osteomyelitis, which I'm not even talking about on this lecture, but MRI is the most important because it adds specificity to the diagnosis because it's so sensitive to marrow changes, right? And especially the T1 specifically. We see dark confluent T1 signal in the bone. That's very specific for the diagnosis of osteomyelitis if there's a clinical question about it. If the patient has a fever or an ulcer and we start to see that finding, the T1 dark signal that's confluent within the bone marrow adds a lot of specificity to the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. So 
MRI is by far the most important imaging modality to evaluate osteomyelitis. Okay? But in, in the America, and I'm sure in Pakistan, CT is obviously more readily available, it's faster, it's cheaper, so sometimes we rely on CT to make that diagnosis. Okay, so osteomyelitis characteristically involves the long bones in the spine. In the long bones, it typically involves the metaphysis and the epiphysis in, child, in infants um, and adults, but only the metaphysis in a child because obviously we have a growth plate, right? So, you know, the growth plate um, is open um, in a child, so you have that barrier, you know, between the metaphysis and the epiphysis. But in an infant, we also have a growth plate, but you have these arterioles or vessels that cross the growth plate when the patient is between zero and one years of age. But however, after the patient becomes one or two, those vessels, you know, involute and they get obliterated. So that's why then you have a real barrier at the physis or the growth plate. And that's why the osteomyelitis stays within the metaphysis in a child. And then obviously when the growth plate fuses as an adult, you tend to see it in the metaphysis and the epiphysis. So that's an interesting pearl about, you know, the way the growth plates work and where osteomyelitis occurs depending on where the patient's age is. So on x-ray, obviously, we look for, you know, cortical irregularity, destruction, periosteal reaction. We may see an ulcer, soft tissue swelling. All these findings could corroborate a diagnosis of osteomyelitis in the appropriate clinical setting. Okay, so this is a nice case of osteomyelitis and septic arthritis of the first interphalangeal joint. Notice that there's, you know, osteopenia, cortical irregularity, destruction. We don't even see the cortex. We don't see the bone here. The subchondral bone here has been, you know, eroded. There's a lot of soft tissue swelling here. Right, this is a classic case for what osteomyelitis would look like on an x-ray. But again, you may not see this in the first two or three weeks of the actual infection. Okay, but this is this is a nice forward case of what osteomyelitis would look like on an x-ray. You know, on CT, you would see the same things that you see on, um, on radiography, but you'll see them better. And you'll start to see some of the classic findings that we see in subacute osteomyelitis. So things like a sequestrum, right, which is an area of necrotic bone that will appear very dense on the CT. An involucrum, which is what I showed in the fibula as my last question when I started this lecture. Um, an involucrum is the bone shell that surrounds the or walls off the infection. Okay, sort of like a periosteal reaction along the long bone. That's the involucrum. And then a Brody's abscess is usually a lytic lesion within the metaphysis or epiphysis, you know, outlined by a sclerotic rib. That's what a Brody's abscess or an intraosseous abscess is. So those are the findings that we see on CT for subacute asthma. So this was the case that I showed. This is the fibula. You can see that there is, you know, this is an involucrum with new bone formation along the cortex or periostitis here that's sort of walling off the infection. You can also see another finding, which is this defect in the underlying bone. That's known as a cloaca. This can allow a sinus tract to form between the marrow and the soft tissues. Okay, so phlegmin can be exuded from the marrow into the soft tissues through a cloaca or a defect in the cortex. So those are nice buzzwords for subacute osteomyelitis, a sequestrum which is an area of necrosis or necrotic bone, an involucrum, which is this periosteal reaction and new bone formation, kind of the infection, a cloaca, which is a defect in the cortical bone that allows a sinus tract to form, and then a Brody's abscess, which is an intraosseous abscess, typically within a metaphysis or a long bone. Okay, so those are important terms that everyone should be familiar with when they're dealing with osteomyelitis. This is a nice appearance of what a Brody's abscess would look like, lucid lesion with a nice sclerotic So this is a question for everyone. I kind of answered it already, but let's just see what people think. So what MR sequence adds specificity to the diagnosis of osteomyelitis? Is it a T1, a T2, post contrast or stir? What essentially, what is the most important sequence on an MRI when we diagnose osteomyelitis? What do folks think here? Give you guys a little, a uh, couple of seconds to ponder this question. So most, important. most important sequence here is it a T1, a T2, a post contrast, or a stir? Okay, so let's answer this. Let's, let's, I'm going to close the poll for this question in about five seconds. Okay, so actually the answer here is T1, right? So remember, I said. Um, that it's really the confluent dark signal within the bone that adds that specificity to the diagnosis of osteomyelitis, right? So when you have T2 signal, right, or a post contrast, a lot of things enhance and a lot of things have edema, right? So tumor enhances, even arthritis can enhance along the subchondral bone. Um, 
you know, if you have a fracture and there's marrow edema, that bone will enhance, um, you know, chronic regional pain syndrome will enhance. There's a lot of diagnoses that will enhance. And there's a lot of diagnoses that will result in T2 and stir hyperintense bright signal, but very few processes will result in confluent dark T1 signal that involves a large portion of the bone. And osteomyelitis is one of those osteomyelitis. So T1 really adds a lot of specificity to the diagnosis of osteom. T2 is not very specific for osteomyelitis, okay? It may be sensitive, but it's not specific. The question was specificity, okay? So that's why T1, I think, is more important and adds more specificity to the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. This is a nice example of what I'm talking about. This is a bone within the ankle slash foot. Look at this dark confluent T1 signal here within the underlying osteo. This would be an example of osteo. There's also a soft tissue ulcer here, but there's this, see how the, the normal bone is nice and fatty and bright on T1, but that fatty marrow has completely been replaced and obliterated with T1 dark signal. I know this is not a lecture on MRI, but I just wanted to show the example because I asked the question. Okay, so on an ultrasound, we if ultrasound would be a very difficult um, modality to diagnose osteomyelitis, but you would see, you know, a little bit of cortical irregularity. Notice you see flex of bone here and not here. There's some shadowing here. There's some gas here around the bone. Okay, there's some phlegmon here. So, you know, this would be a very difficult diagnosis to make on ultrasound. We typically rely on MRI, sometimes CT, but mainly MRI to make the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. Let's turn, switch gears to septic arthritis. So septic arthritis is just infection within the joint, right? Within an articular joint, okay? Uh, this can also be from hematogenous thread, trauma, you know, instrumentation, all sorts of causes, right? So larger joints with abundant blood supply tend to be more susceptible. So things like the shoulder, the hip, the knee, um, you know, the knee is the most common joint to be involved in septic arthritis in an adult. The hip would be the most common in a child, okay? So, you know, those are places that we would, you would want to look at. Really, any joint can be involved in septic arthritis. It's usually a monoarticular process, so it usually involves only one joint. Okay, so if you start to see the same findings in multiple joints, you really shouldn't consider the septic arthritis as a diagnosis. You may be thinking about an inflammatory arthropathy, but again, the most common organism to cause septic arthritis would be Staph aureus. And you know, usually if this is untreated, this is this this is debilitating. This is damaging for patients because it can really result in rapid joint destruction in a matter of days, and that. That destruction is irreversible. So it's very important for us to tap the joint immediately and tailor antibiotic therapy almost immediately, okay? Because this is, this is devastating for patients when they get septic arthritis because it can really result in decreased mobility and decreased function in relatively healthy people in their prime. So it's very important for us to make this diagnosis of septic arthritis. So what you want to do is you want to look for a joint effusion or distension of the joint. You want to look for subchondral erosions the bone being lost around the joint space, uh, destruction of the joint, and cartilage destruction. So those are the classic findings of septic arthritis. So the point, so the joint gets eroded and gets narrowed very fast, but I want everyone to understand and remember that very acutely in the first day or so, the joint's actually gonna widen. The joint's gonna widen. That's because you have a joint effusion. Fluid is gonna distend that joint and make it appear a little wide, but within a couple of days, the joint is gonna rapidly deteriorate and get destroyed and you'll get joint space narrowed. Okay, so septic arthritis is one of those unique things where the joint widens initially, but then narrows almost a day later, okay? So we can use imaging to guide therapy. We can do an arthrocentesis, which is a gold standard therapy or to make the diagnosis, and we treat this aggressively with antibiotics, okay, septic arthritis. So this is a nice example of what an x-ray would look like. You can see soft tissue swelling around the joint. You can see periarticular osteopenia, the minimalization of the bone around the joint is decreased. You can see all this subchondral irregularity and erosions, okay? Joint space loss here. All nice classic um, examples of what septic arthritis would look like, okay? This is a nice example of what septic arthritis is around the hip. You can see gas within the joint space. You can see a large abscess, this fluid collection with peripheral rim enhancement, exuding and extending from the joint into the soft tissue. You can see frank destruction of the underlying bone, even though this is not in your bone window. So this is a nice example of what septic arthritis of the left hip would look like on a CT exam. Okay, on an, on an, on an ultrasound, this is, we're looking at the, you know, the wrist, this is the radius, the lunate, um, the capitate, the metacarpal, okay? This is one of the tendons here, and you can see fluid distending these carpal and intercarpal joints, okay? So a joint effusion is sort of the hallmark of septic arthritis, especially when a effusion is complex and there is, you know, heterogeneity and septations within the fluid, 
that should raise your concern that the fluid is complex and may be a result of septic arthritis in the appropriate clinical setting if the patient has a fee. Here's a nice example of ultrasound appearance of what septic arthritis would look like. Again, the last uh, entity that I want to talk about is septic bursitis. Septic bursitis. Okay, so this means that infection of an underlying bursa. Okay, so bursas are focal pockets of fluid collections that may or may not communicate with the joint. So, you know, the classic teaching is, is that a bursa does not communicate with the joint and a recess is something that does communicate with the joint. But there are some bursa that communicate with the joint. So, for example, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa in the shoulder can communicate with the joint if there's a full thickness rotator your cuff tip. A bigger cyst, which is known as a, or a popliteal cyst, right, is a bursa that communicates with the joint in about 50% of people that are age 50 years and older. So there are some bursa in the body that communicate with the joint, but usually they do not communicate with the joint. And people who get septic bursitis are those that are, you know, immunocompromised, who have septic arthritis. Um, sometimes if the joint is infected, it'll, it'll affect the bursa that extends to that area. And again, staph aureus is the most common organism. So staph aureus, staph aureus is the most common organism for nearly every musculoskeletal infection. And that has a fresh head is where it's polymicrobial, okay? And the most common locations to get septic bursitis is the olecranon bursa along the posterior aspect of the elbow, which I showed you at the beginning of the lecture, and the prepatellar bursa, which is superficial to the patella in the knee, okay? So the treatment really depends on if the bursitis is infected or not, right? Because if it's sterile, we don't do anything that's infected, we may drain it or give antibiotics. This is a nice example of olecranon bursitis at the elbow. Notice that. This is the olecranon and the posterior elbow. There's a nice fluid collection with peripheral rim enhancement. It's pretty much an abscess, right? But it's within the bursa. It's within the space called the olecranon. It's a potential space where you can get fluid. So this is a nice example of what septic bursitis would look like. Note the skin thickening and edema, you know, superficial to this abscess within the olecranon bursa. This is an ultrasound appearance that I showed you earlier on in one of my questions. This is the triceps tendon hyperechoic fibrillar structure that inserts onto the olecranon. All tendons are hyperechoic and fibrillar on ultrasound. This is the olecranon bone. And there should be no space posterior to your olecranon. I mean, if you feel your olecranon process in your elbow, there's not really any fat there. It's a bony protuberance. It doesn't matter how big somebody is, they usually have a bony protuberance there. So if you start to see fluid posterior to the olecranon, you should be thinking about olecranon bursitis, okay? So patients that get this, there's a lot of causes of olecranon bursitis. So patients can get olecranon bursitis from, from trauma, they can get it from infection, but they can also, certain inflammatory arthropathies like rheumatoid arthritis and gout can give you olecranon bursitis. So that was actually the answer to one of my questions. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis and gout typically get olecranon bursitis. In fact, in an older person, if the, if the olecranon bursitis is bilateral, the first thing I think about is gout because gout can result in bilateral olecranon bursitis, okay? So let's come back to the five questions that I did at the beginning, which let's, let's see how much people learned here, right? So what's the next best step in management for this case? Okay, we're looking at a CT image through the thigh. You're seeing findings here. So what's the next best step? Is it to administer antibiotics, call surgery, obtain an MRI, or careful observation? What's the next best step here? Okay, we'll close this question in about five seconds. So it looks like everyone who's answering this has gotten this correct. It's obviously called surgery. This is a surgical emergency. We see gas, again, insinuating between fascial planes here, right? It's the gas between muscles that's the key to making this diagnosis of necrotizing fascia. It's a surgical emergency, okay? The next question is, you know, what's the most likely diagnosis on this ultrasound image? Is this an abscess? Is this myositis? Is this cellulitis or is this necrotizing fasciitis? Yes. Okay, good. So most people are getting this right. Notice that there's a hypochoic heterogeneous collection. There's peripheral hyperemia or peripheral vascularity. This is a nice example of what an abscess would look like. Okay, so this is a nice example uh, of abscess. Okay, let's move on to the next question here. What is the most likely causative organism in the pathology that you're seeing on the CT scan through the thoracic inlet in the upper chest? Is it Streptococcus, Staph aureus, Bacteroids, E. coli, or Pseudomonas? It's the most likely causative organism here. Okay, good. So I think most people are getting this correct. There's hypoattenuation and enlargement of the muscle here. 
okay, in the, in the pectoralis muscle, this is a case of myositis. So the most common organism here would be staph aureus that, I'm, that ever, almost everyone picked. Okay, good. Let's go to case four. Okay, we're looking at the ultrasound of the elbow. I just showed this. Okay, so there's the finding. We're looking at the olecranon, the triceps tendon here. There's the arrow is pointing to a finding here. What can this be seen in? Can this be seen in rheumatoid arthritis, gout, Paget's disease, both rheumatoid arthritis and gout, or all of the above? What's the what can this be seen in? Okay, it looks like most people are getting this right. This is a nice case of olecranon bursitis. We see a complex fluid collection, you know, posterior to the olecranon or superficial to the olecranon. This is seen in both rheumatoid arthritis and gout. Remember, you know, any inflammatory arthropathy, but particularly gout, especially in an older person, you always want to think about gout as one of the findings. Okay, and the last question I have is, what's the abnormality that we're seeing around the fibula here? Is this an involucrum, a sequestration, an abscess, or a tumor? So this patient has subacute osteomyelitis, okay? So is this an involucrum, a sequestration, an abscess, or is this a tumor? Okay, so I think most people are getting this right. You notice that there's a new shell of bone surrounding the cortex here. This is none other than a uh, involucrum that sort of walls off the, the infection, okay? Uh, um, a sequestration is sort of an area of necrotic bone. It would appear very dense within the bone itself, okay? It would appear as an area of increased density within the bone itself. Okay, so what I hope what we've done here is we provide a spectrum of the most common MSK infections. We talked about several different diagnoses. We talked about why we use CT and ultrasound for diagnosis. These are the benefits of using CT and ultrasound, okay, particularly to compartmentalize the, the anatomy and knowing what space we're in, because that'll delineate whether something is myositis versus fasciitis versus cellulitis versus osteomyelitis. And we talked about the CT and ultrasound findings in those seven common MSK infections, okay? So I hope that was somewhat beneficial to you guys. Um, my email is right here in case you have any questions, omer.awan at umm.edu. I'm happy to take questions right now via chat or you guys can unmute yourselves. Um, it was an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Nabia, Nabia Baji for inviting me. Um, I'll turn it over to her, but I'm happy to continue to answer questions here about this talk. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, that was excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Irwan. Anyone who has any questions, uh, please write down in the chat. We actually don't have any questions. So what I would like to now uh, do is uh, thank our speaker, Dr. Irwan, and also thank our audience for um, joining our session today and giving us an opportunity to present online. I hope that you found our educational efforts valuable and interesting. And once again, thank you so much for your time. Take care.